have been observing from afar uh, through the stream and uh, as I've been tweaking my presentation and have been enjoying the presentations and very much um, engaged with the conversations that are going on. And uh, every time I heard a new speaker, I thought, oh, I have an image for that. <laughs> Uh, so as I was talking to Matt Toro, uh, who I appreciate and am grateful to inviting me to participate here uh, in the conference today, um, I have been on many, many new journeys uh, looking at and exploring the imagery related to Native American communities and the Grand Canyon and feel like there's a book there because <laughs> uh, there's so much to be done and seen. I, you know, there, and so we'll, we'll be looking at uh, a few of um, the more well-known images and artists, uh, but there's a lot more. So this is really um, just skimming the surface. Uh, and so again, I do want to thank Mactoa for organizing a dynamic conference to the, on the Grand Canyon and drawing us all together to reflect on the 100th anniversary of the site as a national park and the 150th anniversary of John Wesley Powell's expedition on the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. I would also like to acknowledge that my fellow presenters are making interesting and significant observations throughout the conference about the Grand Canyon and consider the address of individuals and practices related to the Grand Canyon as crucial points of intersection to the representation of indigenous communities. It is good to be here with you. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I worked here for a few years and so I'm happy to be back. Uh, and, but before I get started, um, I do want to lay out um, objectives for myself for this presentation. Um, and those are to address the impact of historic ideologies on contemporary societies, to encourage a critical consciousness about the portrayal of indigenous Americans in history, media, and art, and the detriment on contemporary societies, and to ensure the respectful inclusion and accuracy of indigenous peoples in dialogues, history, art, and policy making. As was mentioned, I manage the ASU School of Transborder Studies Simon Burrow map collection between 2014 and 2017. And my roles and duties included collection management, fund development, project development, research and curating exhibitions. Simon Burrow began collecting maps and books in 1984. He owned factories in the United States and Mexico and motivated by a desire to better understand the borderlands, Burrow began to collect maps and books. In over 20 years, Borough accumulated more than 300 maps and 200 books, which were formally donated to the ASU School of Transborder Studies in August of 2012. Working with the Simon Borough Collection was an opportunity to explore historic cartography, maps, and atlases in relation to colonialism or the systematic process of displacement and oppression of indigenous peoples of the Americas, as well as the collection's relationship to contemporary transborder communities of the southwestern United States. And earlier when I was introduced, it's uh, Latino or Latina, Latinx communities that I also study, not Latin. Uh, eventually, my role as the CSTS collection manager intersected with my work as an art historian and my study of colonial ethnographic print culture of the Americas produced in relation to the European and United States colonial projects. Most of the maps I show from the STX collection today fall into the category of diagrams that generalize the area of the Grand Canyon. However, what they do provide is a framework of development, the tools of empire and nation building, and visual text that narrates history. The School of Transborder Map Collection highlights the different ways the Western Hemisphere has been conceptualized and transformed throughout history. Extending from between the 16th and 20th century, the collection tells a story stretching back to the period of Europe's first contact and culminates with the westward expansion of the United States. The early maps in this collection are from global producers and document and represent the European colonial enterprise. However, the majority of the maps in the collection are from 19th century US agents and focus on the developments of the United States and Mexico border region. And that coincides with the period we're looking at with the beginning of the um, exploration of the Grand Canyon and eventually the mapping. Although many of the individual maps and books are found elsewhere within the STS collection, they come together as a distinct whole. Collectively, the Borough collection of maps tells us about cartography, exploration, land claims, as well as the changing social landscape of colonial colonized lands, 
power dynamics established through processes and systems of colonialism and implications of colonial traumas and social upheaval on contemporary communities, and ultimately about the resilience of indigenous communities in the Americas. This is just a more detailed examination of the map itself. Um, the page I present here is an example of how maps and ethnographic illustrations, and really referring more to the earlier example, uh, within mapping practices and atlases, as well as lends itself to an understanding of how historic images like this can impact contemporary ideologies and policies. The language and imagery incorporated into European print culture about the Americas, such as this, reveals and perpetuates the ongoing nature of the European colonial project of claiming the rich resources of the Americas for Europeans while legitimating any and all methods to do so. Amérique Septentrionale is one of the six maps included in the National Illustrated Atlas of France, which was first published in 1845. And many of the maps in the Simon Burrow collection circulated through atlases. And I would argue that this is true for most historic maps of European time from the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. They were circulated through atlases. Uh, historically, these publications offer information about places identified within the maps, including the area's geopolitical, social, religious, and economic characteristics, much like the internet might today. Atlases came into high volume production in Europe in the 16th century as a direct result of the exploration and colonization of the Americas. There was a great curiosity about the New World and its inhabitants that created a broad market for maps and atlases focused on the Americas. And these types of images and publications are one of the primary methods of disseminating information to mainstream audiences, who in turn used them as references and tools for education. So maps are important, right? Maps are in these atlases and maps were part of this uh, circulation and educational process. I assert that this type of information and formats for circulation in terms of the atlases have become part of the fund of knowledge that we continue to operate from today in terms of indigenous communities of the Americas. In detail. So the map shows us that today's US Southwest was once part of the Spanish Empire and eventually part of Mexico which includes the Grand Canyon. Uh, the illustrations that accompany this map reflect now long tradition of representing indigenous, Americas, uh, indigenous Americans and indicate a codified visual language entrenched in the European colonial project in the Americas. The colorful scene represents romanticized images of Mesoamerica and its indigenous communities throughout North and Central America. Elaborate illustrative border work show cultural natural trade-related items associated distinctly with the Americas. In the background, a train runs through dramatic mountain scenery, which alludes to the civilizing agents of modernity and technology that Europe offers the Americas. On the left, three men who occupy diverse ranks of society stand together. At the bottom, center of the sheet, a female figure reclines, surrounded by food and animals. The abundance of fruits and vegetables suggests the abundance of resources Europeans only dreamed of as they set sail in the 16th century and had become dependent on by the 19th century. Her placement marks her as the focal point of the sheet and more importantly, a key to reading the whole scene. The one-shoulder toga she wears continues the European preference for classicizing indigenous people. Her exposed breast reveals the European attitude towards the Americas in the sense that the new lands were fertile, making them desirable and inviting and as a consequence, plundered without consent. Her breast also symbolizes a lack of modesty which Europeans associate with barbarism, like that of her shirtless male counterparts. The alignment of the female figure with the dog further suggests a lack of reason due to assumed animalistic tendencies. Furthermore, her inactivity as she lounges, sorry, not only conveys laziness or lack of development, but also alludes to a sexually charged availability. These types of visual depictions perpetuate invented misunderstandings about indigenous Americans and recirculate xenophobic representations of otherness through print material that further distorts, disfigures, and destroys. Although I do not have the luxury of unpacking the extensive history of colonial ethnographic illustrations here, I bring in this example to introduce you to this pra practice of othering indigenous communities through image for the purpose of colonialism, often packaged as progress, modernism, and manifest destiny. And again, here is just a detail of the map. <clears throat> I'd like to return to and locate myself as a historian in looking at this uh, quote 
by Hobsbawm and Ranger. And it, it guides me in my approach to image and in my discussions of the significance of images. Uh, and it reads, history that becomes the fund of knowledge or ideology of nation, state, or movement is not what we has, is not what has actually been preserved in popular memory, but what has been selected, written, pictured, popularized, and institutionalized by those whose function it is to do so. All historians, whatever their objectives, are engaged in this process inasmuch as they contribute consciously or not to the creation, dismantling, and restructuring of images of the past which belong to the public sphere of man as a political being. And I bring this image to you as an even earlier example, right, from the 16th century of what I just showed you from the 19th century, the first image. Um, and so I go off the, off the written text here to start just trying to address the numerous points that I would like to talk to you about uh, before my time runs out. Uh, but the image I showed to you was produced 300 years after this image. So the point of this perpetuation of a codified language that is informing how indigenous people are represented and the ideologies that they communicate about them um, hopefully is evident to you in the span of 300 years. And I would argue this visual language informs the representation of indigenous peoples beyond and through today, right? So that these ideas of, for instance, you can see in the middle of the two figures Possibly you can tell there's a scene of some barbecuing going on and there happens to be a leg or two cooking, suggesting cannibalism. And this is not the only practice we see of this type of visual imagery. Uh, here's another 16th century image um, where you can see the hanging tree. And to your right, you can see the table where the leg is being cut up and somebody gnawing on an arm. Okay, so you know the, these images I bring to you because they are what informs the representation of indigenous communities during the colonial project of the US even, uh, because it, they fulfill the same purpose, which is to legitimate right, westward expansion. Uh, and some, some essential questions that came up for me as I was preparing for this talk and in terms of trying to figure out what images to talk about um, are, um, how did the Grand Canyon bestow a sense of national identity how, was the Grand Can How has the Grand Canyon been used by the United States to express values and beliefs over time? How has the Grand Canyon contributed to U.S. culture? And how does the Grand Canyon evoke U.S. culture? And within these questions, I'm asking myself, where are indigenous Americans? Uh, and I bring this map, which is very difficult to read, but an important map. It uh, is produced in 1854. It relates to the efforts after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was based on faulty maps, the, the Distronel map, right? The U.S. was using the 12th edition. Mexico was using the 7th edition. They're trying to establish a new boundary between the United States and Mexico after the Mexico and U.S. War. And because of the faulty nature of the map, unfortunately, um, most of the maps in the Simon Burrow collection are faulty. Um, and we can talk more about that. Uh, but uh, the, the point is that um, they had to go back and they had to walk what is today the boundary, the U.S.-Mexico boundary. And it took a number of years, and there were both U.S. and Mexico officials involved. Um, and many times when we're talking about the production of maps, and we're talking about the Grand Canyon expeditions and the explorers, we're talking about national projects. We're talking about national agents. And so therefore, we're talking about national history. So this matters. It matters what we're including, what we're not including. It matters what we're saying, what we're not saying on maps, in atlases, uh, with image, with text. This is our history. And uh, in this map in particular, I'm trying to point, pinpoint there's text. And I think you can see here and here, there it is. And what it says is the region, what it says is the region's uninhabited, barren, open for development. Yet we know. 14 tribes have been in constant and continuous existence in Arizona. Where did they go? Or were they simply discounted, erased through omission? And this is significant. This is a national document. This map was produced through a national project. 
And so when we talk about the revision of history, it's not something we're doing today. It's something that's happened historically. We've heard the phrase, history is written by the victors. So we have to understand that history is more complex than what we are taught in K through 12 education. But I ask myself, how do we teach ourselves history? Especially if we're talking about Arizona history, and that's our focus here as well. Uh, and I have spent much time investigating uh, and actually have a side project where I actually did a, a, a a grant funded, a similarly uh, IHR grant funded project where I um, pulled out the history of Mexican descent communities uh, in terms of their contributions to the development of Arizona, which has been written out of history. If you go to state websites, such as the one I'm bringing up to you here, um, this is how we're telling Arizona history. This is how indigenous communities are represented and or not. Uh, and here you have the 12th century reference to indigenous peoples, and it isn't until we get down to 1886 with Geronimo, who we're killing, <laughs> that we mention them again. And so what type of history are we teaching our children? Uh, and my point is just that it is lacking diversity and lacking uh, the, the, in, the indigenous communities and their contributions. Uh, you can go to numerous sites, the state official site that tells the history of Arizona begins with statehood, begins with statehood, as if nothing of relevance happened before. And I do remember hearing um, a few folks uh, the, uh, earlier today talk about, yes, there were indigenous peoples in the canyons, uh, and they were also likely mapping, and yet are we talking about that? Have we included that? Uh, when we talk about the Grand Canyon pioneers, um, again, this is history. If, you know, and a lot of this, you can, a lot of this I pull up straight from the internet. And I use the internet as the contemporary archive for the people. This is what people do when they want to learn about something, when they want to know about something. They go to the internet. And so this is the history that they're being told in terms of the Grand Canyon. Uh, but we have to remember, right, these, this is just a brief list of the communities, indigenous communities that are associated with the Grand Canyon. Uh, and the Grand Canyon webpage does do an effort to represent these groups. Uh, but again, is it indigenous communities talking for themselves or are we talking for them? Uh, and we have to be considerate of uh, stereotypes, right? When we're thinking about history and representation, there are stereotypes that have been constructed. And the first images that I brought to you are related to the nature of stereotypes, such as the noble savage or the vanishing Indian. And the vanishing Indian really gets solidified in the 1830s with the Indian Removal Act, right? And so policy, ideology, imagery are all linked in the telling of history, in the telling of the role of indigenous peoples. Uh, and, you know, I could go in much more depth about um, these stereotypes and how problematic they are and how much of them might be inventions. Uh, but due to lack of time, I cannot. Uh, I also wanted to look at what, um, what happened at the time of the uh, establishment of the Grand Canyon. And so I was looking at uh, Roosevelt's statement, who says, to the good Indians here, I want to say a word of welcome, as if they weren't here before. But I appreciate that the National Park Service is talking about the National Parks telling the story of the Americas, and that's what I'm here to also reiterate. But the point being is that indigenous peoples have been left out, and or when they're included, it's often in very derogatory manners. I know someone's gonna be talking about the PAL expedition. None of that would have happened without the indigenous communities helping and working with him. And yet when we look at the representation of these great explorers, such as Ives, um, it's either a study of the indigenous communities or a heroic representation of exploration alone without them, right? They're, either, they're there to study and observe, but they're never part of the historical record that we value in terms of the establishment of the canyon and the exploration and, and the survival. That, all of that would not have happened without indigenous presence, guides, informants. And just looking at an image like this, when you look at Ives' work, he does this type of specimen representation, scientific, right, where the indigenous person is completely devoid of a background, of place. Um, 
as if they don't really even belong to the canyon. And yet when you see images of Ives or the Cole brothers or Powell in the canyon, they're in the, on the river, there's landscape all around, they're very much entrenched in the space. And so I, I would ask you, what do you think it means to remove the indigenous communities from that space, both literally, metaphorically, visually? And I can just quickly show you a number of representations. And what I will ask you is, where are the indigenous peoples in these images, right? And, and I, I, I would love to get into more of it. We do have one example at the tower house uh, that you probably see where you have indigenous people making art. So it's not that they're not there. It's not that they're not producing their own material culture. Sometimes it's in a type of zoo or entertainment-like style, which we could also talk about what that perpetuates in terms of stereotypes and oppression. Um, but what I'm going to do here is just leave you lastly with this image, which kind of encapsulates what I'm talking about. Uh, our history typically describes the discovery and colonization of the Americas through the lens of European and American explorers, such as Christopher Columbus and John Wesley Powell, and omits the experience of the indigenous people of the continent. Look what I've discovered, a cartoon from 2004 by Eric Garcia, presents an alternative perspective to this narrative. In his image, here the artist flips the role of assumed relational power between discoverers and discovered, conquerors and conquered, and I would add explorers, uh, this version, or counter-memory, revises, reframes, and refocuses this story by viewing the experience through the lens of the indigenous communities of the Americas who are otherwise not typically acknowledged as active agents in history. Eric Garcia, as I do, sets out to counter false histories, extreme viewpoints, and stereotypes by restructuring images as visual text that critiques the system that generates these positions and provides a more inclusive understanding of who we are. Thank you. Oh, okay, I finished early. They were flashing five minutes twice. <laughs> so We've I got a couple minutes. extra minutes, yep. Any questions for Teresa? Test, test. Um, do you know anything about how indigenous peoples did what we call mapping? Um, can you give us some thoughts or some points of interest? I've read a little bit, but only just a little, and it's definitely not what the Europeans did. I, I, I have really struggled finding materials. Um, I mean, this is a much bigger project. I'm really excited about researching and really getting to archives and original sites, right? Hopefully at the Grand Canyon, they have their own collections and perhaps in, even there we'll find something. But what I can refer to is Mesoamerican mapping traditions, which is very different. Because when we talk about Western representation versus indigenous, we are talking about completely different ways of knowing and being and representing. And so you will often have more abstract representations, um, references to places, um, you know, through simple elements such as, you know, mounds. Uh, we do have a sense of the stories and the traditions, right, oral history. And I believe a lot of that mapping right, is through oral history, the passing down of history and information, which is a very long tradition within indigenous communities. Um, but there's also cave paintings and cave drawings and things of that nature, petroglyphs. And so I think we can start to see a very symbolic approach to uh, visualization, right? How, how do we visualize our ideas, I think, is really what we're talking about. And they would be doing it more symbolically and through metaphor. Not particularly, no. Would you like to share something about it? The Zuni mapping project he was asking about. Uh, Zuni artists have put together a collection of paintings that are metaphorical representations of their traditional homeland. And we did an exhibition of that work at the Museum of Northern Arizona oh. uh, three years ago. Oh, that'd be great to see. That's yeah, something so if you're to interested, look up. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, as someone who, who's been very interested in pre-Columbian and especially colonial history for a while, obviously there's stuff like the Black Legend. 
And I was curious as you were talking about the portrayal of Amerindians in the 16th and 17th century maps, do you see similar attitudes or, or a similar attempt to paint them in a corner? Do you see that applied by your by um, say Anglo Americans to the Spanish and then eventually Hispanics as well later on when there becomes more interaction with them? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do see right a relationship with contemporary practices, ideologies, uh, and, and all the way leading back to e representations and atlases in these early images. And, and so I can, in relation to these kind of colonial power structure dynamics, then we can also, in terms of a contemporary impact, we can talk about the lynching of Mexicans, right, when the U.S.-Mexico border did shift and people being th feeling threatened. Um, by loss of, of land and nation that actually belonged to the people that were being lynched. So a misunderstanding of even place or history, right? Even then, at the moment, right? Even though they were there and saw the border shift, suddenly the idea of place and belonging shifted too. Uh, and so that goes hand in hand with the colonial project, with mapping and claiming. We, we claim it, we own it, it's ours, right? And so um, we can also liken it to um, statements we're hearing today about immigrants being uh, violent, lazy, right? These same images of cannibalism come up, right? These are not new ideas. They're entrenched, and, and we don't even understand how deep they run. But it's, it's because it's been very much a part of our history, our history, right? It's all of our history. Uh, and I feel that the more we understand, perhaps the better we can operate and perhaps diversify and just create a more holistic, diverse, realistic representation of what history is, inclusive of all those that participated. And I actually bring to you the John Wesley map. John Wesley Powell map this is a very significant map. It's in, this, in the Simon Burrow map collection. Um, and it's in relation to what you were saying, right, the Zuni mappers trying to today contemporize and kind of reach back and, and talk to mapping today. Um, there's a website dedicated to this map by indigenous people who, who through scholarship, through research, underline why this is so problematic. Uh, not to uh, undermine the next talk that's coming up with, uh, about Powell, um, but this map in particular, I think, makes very clear. One of the things I didn't get to say is, you know, most of the maps that are produced around, about the New World, their cartographers had never seen the Americas, had never been to the Americas. There was a lot of guesstimation, if not invention. And what, that can be also said of this map, right? How in the 19th century was this individual able to do such a study that he could lay claim to understand and know all the language groups, right, across the country in the 19th century? Ask yourself, would we accept that type of a study today? I don't think we would. And yet this becomes, Powell is a significant national figure Right? In terms of ethnographic study and language study, he's still relevant today to many students. And yet, we are ba we are, uh, the foundation of this practice is on faulty maps. One more? Thank you. Nope. Oh. One more time. No, we'll take one more. Okay. This is a comment rather than a question, but there are many Indian tribes that consider themselves having arrived at this level on Earth, having come from levels below what we consider the surface. There are three tribes that consider the Grand Canyon the source of their arrival, the Hopi, the Zuni, and the Wallapai who currently actually live in the Grand Canyon. And I would suggest in as much as they consider this holy ground, sacred place, that we consider that when, when we determine what is enough of Bears Ears or the size of the Grand Canyon or other such places considered sacred, holy, special by other people when we 
determine what we're thinking about doing to them. Yes, the place to end. <laughs>